Great. Thank you all for joining. Now that it's 10 o'clock, we're going to begin today's webinar. My name is Liz Allen and I'll be moderating this webinar today. I'd like to welcome you to the first in a series of four BioEarth webinars reporting on recent climate change and nutrient dynamics research in the Northwest U.S. In this first webinar of our series, we will focus on monitoring and modeling sources and impacts of atmospheric nitrogen deposition in the region. This series is hosted by the Center for Sustaining Agriculture and Natural Resources at Washington State University in partnership with the BioEarth Regional Earth Systems Modeling Team. Funding for the BioEarth project and associated stakeholder engagement activities, including this series, has been provided by the National Institute for Food and Agriculture at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Great. The aim of the BioEarth project has been to link atmospheric, hydrological, and land surface models to enhance our understanding of regional carbon and nitrogen dynamics and to provide researchers and decision makers with management relevant information about how climate change may affect natural resource um, and agricultural systems in the Northwest. So before we get started, I'd like to go over a few quick points about logistics for this morning. This webinar will work best on your computer if you close all other applications while you participate. And throughout the presentation, all participants will remain muted. We'll have two presenters speaking today, both of whom are PhD candidates at WSU's School of Biological Sciences, who have been embedded in the BioEarth research effort since its beginning in 2011. We're going to hold questions until the end of both presentations, but you may ask questions at any time by typing them into the questions pod on your control panel, and they'll be answered as time allows at the end. And here you'll see that questions pod um, circled in yellow. If you can't see your control panel, the orange arrow on the top right of your screen will expand it or hide it. And there's that orange arrow you're looking for. There's also a screen button that toggles the full screen on and off. You may want to watch at full screen and then toggle back if you'd like to enter a question into the questions pod. If you have any technical questions, please use the questions pod and my colleague Tara Zimmerman, who is running the technical side of this webinar, will do what she can to help you. Then there's, sorry. Um, our webinar today is being recorded for later viewing and it will be freely available on CSANR's website. Following today's presentation, there will be a brief electronic evaluation. Please take a moment and provide your feedback there. Great. This webinar series builds on BioEarth stakeholder workshops that were held from 2013 to 2015 in order for researchers to learn more about climate change information needs within specific environmental decision-making sectors. You can find reports from those previous workshops online at the BioEarth website's publications page. These links are also available via the CSANR webinar information page, so there's no need to worry about writing them down now. We hope that you'll engage in the upcoming webinars in this series. You can read more about the topics and presenters for those BioEarth webinars on our website as well. And on Thursday, February 16th, we will be hosting a free stakeholder workshop at the WSU Tri-Cities campus to focus on what BioEarth models can tell us about intersections of resource management decisions and climate change impacts focusing on agricultural systems. And you can read more about that workshop and register online. So today's webinar will begin with an overview of the environmental challenges associated with excess nitrogen in the, in the environment presented by WSU School of Biological Sciences PhD candidate Sarah Anderson. Sarah will share insights from her research about what lichen sampling can tell us about nitrogen deposition from industrial and agricultural sources over time. At WSU in Pullman, Sarah was a fellow with the National Science Foundation Integrative Graduate Education and Research, or IGERT, Nitrogen Systems Policy Oriented Research Program. Starting in the new year, Sarah will be serving as a Canal Sea Grant Legislative Fellow in the office of Michigan Senator Gary C. Peters in Washington, D.C., where she'll be working to connect current scientific knowledge to the policy-making process. So without further ado, I'd like to hand the presentation over to Sarah. <clears throat> Hi, Liz. Thank you so much for that introduction. And and I would just like to thank you all for joining us today on this webinar. Um, I'm very excited to have an op this opportunity to share some of my dissertation research 
research that's focused on looking at how we can understand changes in nitrogen deposition over time. And so just a little bit of background about nitrogen. Um, most nitrogen, and historically it's been a very limited ele limiting element to growth, has been tied up in the atmosphere in the unreactive form of N2. And prior to about a century, century and a half ago, there were really only two ways to have that unreactive form become a reactive form that's usable by life. And that was via lightning and um, legumes and the biolog uh, um, biological nitrogen fixation that the bacteria in um, symbiosis with legume plants can, can do to fix nitrogen to that reactive form. And it was so limiting that we would fight wars over this. There were um, several different wars over different um, nitrogen stockpiles or, or guano mounds um, off the coast of South America. <clears throat> and um, so our increase in our, our, our accessibility of reactive nitrogen, um, or our, our, how we've changed the nitrogen cycle, has really come about because of two main things. Um, our intensification of agriculture culture and as well as fossil fuel combustion it has really um, added to this amount of nitrogen that's available to, to living to living things and then what really changed and created greater imbalances in this um, balance between reactive and unreactive forms was the industrial or the creation of the industrial process to fix nitrogen to these usable forms and that was a process invented by two German scientists Haber and Bosch um, and has greatly increased the amount of extra nitrogen available in the environment. And um, nitrogen, you can kind of think of it, this extra nitrogen as candy. Having a little bit is really good. It, um, you know, it, it, it makes life better, but once you have way too much, there are lots of really negative consequences that can come about. And um, with sugar, we know what those are for children, but in the environment, we can see a lot of different impacts of, of this extra nitrogen. And um, globally, we see acidification where um, different nitrogen compounds cause the acidification of soils as well as of different water, waterways. It also has a fertilizing effect and causes eutrophication and, and algal blooms and um, increased growth in, in different terrestrial ecosystems. And these two effects have a whole slew of different consequences for ecosystems and can cause decreased biodiversity, um, a decline in forests, as well as water quality issues, as well as um, different impacts that Justin will be talking about a little bit later in the webinar. Um, so to better understand um, nitrogen deposition coming from the atmosphere, which is the main way this extra nitrogen gets to really sensitive ecosystems, we can use lichens as a tool. And the U.S. Forest Service has been using lichens as an indicator of nitrogen de deposition and nitrogen pollution for um, a couple decades now. And lichens are just really good indicators of de deposition for two main reasons. They have a really poor ability to regulate uptake, and so they end up acting more like sponges out in the environment, um, really reflecting the conditions that, that, they're, that they exist in. Um, in addition to their poor ability to regulate, they also re are very reliant, especially apophytic lichens, on deposition as their primary source of nitrogen, making them really reflective of the deposition coming into ecosystems. And so what we did is we used lichens to begin to try to understand how nitrogen deposition has changed over time. And so we looked at it across the western U.S. you can see on this map here we have 16 different regions outlined in green and what I what we did is I went to 10 different herbaria as well as had access to the U.S. Forest Service collection of lichens and selected lichen samples that had been originally collected at different times throughout the 20th century from these different regions. Um, today's data that I'm be showing you comes from our analysis of different samples of this lichen species Lotharia vulpina and what we did with these samples is I subsampled very as, as minimal of an amount as possible from the collection sample, brought it back to the WSU um, core stable isotope laboratory. We analyzed the nitrogen content, which informed us, informs us about the amount of nitrogen deposition um, at the time that that lichen was collected. And then we also analyzed the stable isotope composition of those lichens, which tells us about the sources contributing, the emission sources contributing to nitrogen deposition um, at that location and at that time that the lichen was collected. And so um, what ends up happening is nitrogen comes predominantly from two different sources, and the stable isotope analyses can help us distinguish between these sources. 
And so on one hand, we have our industrial sources with very high isotope values, and on the other end of the spectrum, we have agricultural emission sources with very low stable isotope values. And these stable isotope values are really just a proportion of the heavier isotope up here versus the lighter isotope. And so it's really just a ratio. And so the value differs between different sources. And as all these emission sources with their different isotope values emit nitrogen up into the atmosphere, it mixes around, comes back down in the form of deposition, whether wet or dry, and lands on our lichen, where it's absorbed and assimilated into those lichen tissues, which we can then take that lichen and analyze it to get a snapshot at the deposition that occurred at that time. And so what we found when we were looking at nitrogen content, which, was an, which is a good indicator of the amount of nitrogen deposition at that time, is we saw a very similar trend across species and across all of our regions, using the Cascades as an example here. What we saw was we saw an increase of nitrogen deposition over time. On this figure, we have um, eight different time periods delineated on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, we have the, the nitrogen content measured as percent of present nitrogen of the lichen tissues. And we see this increase over time, and then it reaches a peak, and then that peak and then decreases in late in the 20th century and early into the 21st century. And that peaking and decreasing, the timing of that peak varied between regions. And so in some regions, in five regions, we saw that I'm peak sorry. occur. Yes? Sarah, I'm sorry to interrupt you. You're, for That's some okay. reason, your sidebar is showing and is blocking your slides. Oh. I shouldn't do that, but can you use your orange arrow and minimize it? And then that'll yes, give us I a fuller view. All Let's right. Thank you, Tara. Okay. Sure. Sorry about that. Sorry, Go ahead. About, that. <laughs> Sorry about that, everyone. Um, but as I was saying, so we saw that increase and then it peaked um, for five regions in the 1970s. Those five regions um, are outlined here in blue and occurred mostly in the Rockies um, and, and the eastern part of the western U.S. Um, in four other regions, or in three other regions, we saw that peak in nitrogen content be occur in the 1980s and then a subsequent decrease. And that peak occurred in the three regions outlined in blue here along the California coast, some of our most western regions. And then the remaining re four regions had that nitrogen content peak in the 1990s, and these occurred along the Cascades and Sierra Nevadas, and you can see them outlined here in blue. And um, what's really fascinating about this is that the lichen nitrogen content, it's really paralleling these changes in emissions. And so here we have um, time on the uh, x-axis for both these figures, and then they're scaled the same um, but re and represent NOx emissions or nitrogen oxide emissions and represent how nitrogen emissions have changed over time. And you can see beginning in 1940 on the far left a very almost exponential increase up until the 1970s. And then it starts to plateau, and it's at that plateauing where we begin to see like a nitrogen content peak. And then it's kind of stays plateaued through the 1990s and really begins to decrease um, post 2000. And that very much matches when and how we see like a nitrogen content peak across our regions through time and then all of the regions seeing a decrease by the 21st century. And yeah, those decreases occur post-1990. Um, the other really fascinating thing about lichen nitrogen content is um, in different regions it's been used to determine a critical load, um, which is a level of pollution below which ecosystems are, are safe from negative impacts and above which we see negative ecological impacts in these environments. And so when we exceed that critical load, we begin to see negative um, impacts to our ecosystems. And so for lichen nitrogen, um, so for lichen nitrogen content for this species, Lotharia vulpina, the critical load has been determined to be 1.03% for nitrogen content um, by the Forest Service um, in the Cascades region. And so what that means is that for, for most, prior to 1970, nitri lichen nitrogen content was below this level, um, indicating you know, these ecosystems are not in the Cascades are not impacted um, negatively by extra nitrogen, but beginning around 1970 and through the and up until the present, we see that di um, different places and and different um, and to d different extents, we have nitrogen content far above that 1.03 percent, indicating that we are having nitrogen deposition levels much higher um, than the critical load, indicating that negative ecological impacts may be happening. Mm -hmm. 
On the flip side, that stable isotope composition of these ligands that tells us about emission sources has a much more complex pattern than the nitrogen content did. Um, and so in here we have the same time periods on the x-axis, but this time the nitrogen stable isotope composition on the y-axis. And you can see a less smooth trend, but an increase in the stable isotope composition um, uh, on the graph. And this kind of increase occurred in the seven regions outlined in kind of the light blue on the map to the right. In an additional four regions, we saw no significant change from our first time period to our last time period in the stable isotope composition. And those four regions are outlined here on the map to the right in that light blue color. And you can see that there, um, the different letters represent different groupings. And there's from the beginning to the end, although there's some oscillating, there's no significant change. Um, and then in one region for Lotharia vulpina, we see a slight decrease from the first time period to the last time period, although again, it's you know, increases, it goes up, it goes down, and that's in the one region highlighted in light blue on the map to the right. And so what we really can see is that the stable isotope composition is much more complex, and what this indicates is that this increase in emissions, which we saw in the increase like in nitrogen content is coming from different sources and a mixture of sources. And that makes sense if we take a closer look at the um, emissions figure um, that we looked at prior with time on the x-axis and the amount of nitrogen emissions on the y-axis. And each of these different colors represents a different type of emission source from fossil fuel, from fuel combustion in green to industrial processes of dark blue to road vehicle emissions in light blue and so on and so forth. And so you can see that all these different emission sources, some of them increase, some of them decrease, um, but they don't necessarily change at the same time and in the same place. And so it's this, this difference in, in this oscillating in these emission sources that's being reflected in the ligand stabilized composition. And so to summarize, um, we looked at the nitrogen content or the amount of nitrogen in lichen tissues to get an idea of the amount of deposition over time. And so we could begin to infer the nitrogen deposition rates from these lichens, as well as identify areas that were exceeding that, those critical loads or that safe threshold of amount of nitrogen deposition for these, for these areas. Our lichen stable isotope co um, composition painted a much more complicated picture though. Um, than the patterns of nitrogen content. And overall, we saw an increase in the stable isotope in some regions, which points to fossil fuel emission sources. But overall, these patterns are pretty complicated and not very smooth, indicating that there's a mix of sources contributing to nitrogen deposition and the increase that we see over time. And really, um, what this, to summarize what this work can show is how lichens can be really powerful tools and begin to expand our measurements and analysis of nitrogen deposition beyond um, the current monitoring networks. And so um, as I finish up my portion of the talk, I do want to acknowledge uh, the funding sources, uh, both the NSF IGRIT that paid for this, as well as the BioEarth project that helped fund this research, as well as all the institutions that allowed me to come in and subsample from their collections and, and really get access to some, some lichen specimens that were very old and begin to understand nitrogen deposition as far back as the turn of the 20th century. And I thank you very much for this opportunity. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so I'd like to encourage you to go ahead and submit questions to Sarah through the questions pod um, and take a minute to, to formulate your questions and type those in. Um, and I'd now like to introduce our next speaker, Justin Poinsett, who, like Sarah, is one of WSU's Integrative Graduate Education and Research, or IGERT, Nitrogen Systems Policy-Oriented Research Fellows. Justin will speak today about his field research in subalpine vegetation communities and snow fields of the Northwest, looking at vegetation responses to increased rates of nitrogen deposition. Justin will explore how ecological modeling and experimental studies together can enhance our understanding of nitrogen deposition and climate change impacts in high elevation ecosystems. So Justin, I'm handing the presentation over to you now and we're looking forward to your talk. All right, thanks Liz and thanks everyone for tuning in. So as Liz mentioned, I'll be discussing aspects of my dissertation research on the impacts of nitrogen deposition on sub ecosystems of Pacific Northwest and also discussing other sensitive systems uh, within our region. I conducted this research at Mount Rainier National Park, which you can see here in the background. 
And before we begin, I'd like to th acknowledge uh, funding and support from the BioWorks Project, the National Park Service, and the Inspire Igert at Washington State. So as Sarah mentioned, uh, nitrogen deposition begins with the emissions of ammonia, usually from volatilized fertilizer, and nitrogen oxides from combustion that rise into the atmosphere, are transported and transformed through meteorology and atmospheric chemistry, and then deposited on ecosystems that could be you know, pretty remote from the actual emission source. And while small amounts of nitrogen can have a fertilizing effect and increase productivity in these systems, uh, rates that are too high can have detrimental impacts, as Sarah mentioned. And these impacts vary depending on the system that you're talking about. So looking at some sensitive receptors in uh, of each system to the northwest, if you look at sagebrush shrublands, deposition can promote the invasion of annual grasses, leading to increased fire susceptibility. And conifer forests, you can see loss of nitrogen sensitive species, of lichen species leading to declines in lichen biodiversity. In montane watersheds, you can have nitrogen enrichment causing eutrophication or acidification. And in alpine and subalpine meadows, high rates of deposition can cause declines in vegetation diversity and changes in nutrient cycling. And that's what I'm going to focus on today on my talk. It's important to consider that these sensitive systems and receptors vary widely across the region, and they cover a lot of different areas. And what we're particularly focused on are areas that are in class one areas that are impacted by deposition. And these are wilderness areas that we're really interested in. And these can range from national parks, such as Olympic, Mount Rainier, and North Cascades, to national forest uh, service lands, such as Glacier Peak and Alpine Lakes Wilderness, to Native American reservations, such as the East Spokane Reservation in eastern Washington. And these class one areas are of particular interest because there's a legal mandate to keep these areas in pristine ecological condition. And when you have high rates of deposition causing detrimental effects like acidification or promotion of, of annual grasses, you can't really say that these areas are still in the, the pristine condition that we found them in. So the tool that we use to manage for critical loads or manage for nitrogen deposition in the Northwest is the critical load concept. And as Sarah mentioned, it's, this is the deposition threshold at which detrimental ecological effects occur. And these different receptors range in their sensitivity to nitrogen deposition. Some of the most sensitive indicators that we have can be changes in lake diatom community composition and re reduced lake and biodiversity. Some more moderately sensitive receptors could be the acidification of alpine lakes. And then some of the most, the most you know, robust uh, receptors could be changes in the plant community composition. But one receptor or one indicator we don't really have a great handle on yet and was the focus of my research is this change in soil nutrient cycling, particularly in these subalpine and alpine ecosystems. And these systems, uh, you know, we had these systems across the Northwest. I was looking at them particularly in the Cascade Range spanning Washington, Oregon. And although they're a very small land area compared to some other systems that we have, like forest or shrubland, you can see them highlighted here in blue. The majority of these subalpine and alpine systems are found in these class one wilderness areas. So we do have a legal mandate to protect these systems. And something interesting to consider about these systems that really dictates a lot of the nutrient cycling or biogeochemistry of them is that they have very low vegetation productivity because they have such short growing seasons. These systems are covered by snow for eight to 10 months out of the year and that limits how much sunlight they can get and limits their growth and really dictates you know, a lot of the responses that we see due to deposition. Just to give you a brief overview of what the nutrient cycle looks like in these systems. Again, beginning with deposition, you have the deposition falling out of the atmosphere. Um, because these systems are covered with snow for such a long part of the year, most of that deposition does fall into the snowpack and pool. Um, once the snowpack melts every year, which can be anywhere from July to August in, in these mountain systems, um, that snowpack nitrogen then enters the, what I'm calling the ecosystem nitrogen storage pool. So we can either be taken up by plants, stored in vegetation, or retained in the soil. And from this storage pool, you can have loss to the atmosphere, 
either as N2 or atmospheric N2, which makes up most of our atmosphere, as Sarah mentioned, or as nitric, ox nitric oxide, or as nitrous oxide, which is a very potent greenhouse gas. And you can also have loss due to uh, leached nitrogen into watersheds, which can exacerbate some of the conditions I mentioned before, like acidification and eutrophication. So the questions I wanted to answer with my research were what are the forms and rates of nitrogen deposition to subalpine ecosystems and look at how these might differ to other uh, low elevation ecosystems in the Northwest? What are the critical loads for subalpine nitrogen storage and loss? And then how will climate change really affect these critical loads? How will it affect these systems response to elevated rates of nitrogen deposition? So I'll start with this first question, looking at the forms and rates of nitrogen deposition. So again, I, I conducted this study at Mount Rainier National Park. So in winter, I would go up and actually take samples of the snowpack to look at the end deposition, end deposition that was stored there kind of all winter long. And there are, I was, what I was doing was comparing these, these rates at high elevations to measurements taken at low elevations. So you can see what we expected to find was between one to three kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year. And those are measurements conducted by the National Atmospheric Deposition Program, or NADP, and those were taken just outside of Mount Rainier at Tahoma Woods. What we found instead were slightly elevated rates of three to four kilograms of N per hectare per year. Um, this wasn't too surprising, as deposition often possibly correlates with precipitation, and mountain environments in the Northwest usually get more precipitation than lower elevations do. Um, what was more surprising was the form of nitrogen that we found. Um, based on some of the work that Sarah's doing and others have done, we expect to see that the majority of end deposition would be nitrate because there's a lot of um, combustion sources nearby the Cascades that could contribute to nitrate deposition. What we found instead was that ammonium was the dominant end form in the snowpack deposition. Uh, this was surprising because ammonium is typically considered to be a deposition form that falls out close to the emission source, so within you know, a few kilometers. And there are no real large you know, agricultural operations nearby to Mount Rainier that would be a large ammonium source or a large, large emission source. So we're still trying to riddle out what the, the ammonium source of these remote montane systems might be. Uh, moving on to the second question, looking at the critical loads for subalpine nitrogen storage and loss. So again, we talked about uh, the end deposition and the snowpack end. Now the critical loads I'm looking at, you know, how well does the ecosystem store nitrogen in the vegetation and soil pools versus how quickly does it lose nitrogen as nitrous oxide emissions or leaching into watersheds through groundwater. So for this, I use an experimental manipulation where I added nitrogen to the system to try to find what this critical load might be. So I had four different treatments. I had the ambient deposition rate, which that year was 3.3 uh, kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year. And then I added plus three, five, and 10 kilograms of N per hectare per year as my different, tre different treatments of the snowpack. Um, as the snow melted, that nitrogen was lost, you know, went into the ecosystem. I then didn't, I didn't followed that nitrogen to see where it went and measured the vegetation and soil nitrogen pools as well as how much was lost from the system um, as nit nitrous oxide emissions or as leaching into watersheds. Just to briefly, briefly sum up, summarize a lot of results into a couple of short slides, um, I increased the nitrogen deposition by 3 to 10 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year. What I found was that the vegetation was able to increase their uptake of nitrogen by about 5 kilograms of N per hectare per year, so about a 10% increase in uptake and the soil is able to retain about an additional six kilograms of N per hectare per year, uh, which is only, was actually like a less than 1% increase in the total soil end pool because this, the soil end pool is already so large. Uh, but most of that large soil end pool is actually not available um, or is stored bound so tightly to the soil it actually can't be lost from the system. The nitrogen losses were actually a lot more responsive to the increase in deposition Again, increased deposition from 3 to 10 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year. I found that uh, nitrogen, N2O emissions increased by 0.5 kilograms per N per hectare per year, which is a 200% increase or quadrupled the nitrous oxide emissions. 
and then nitrogen leaching the watersheds increased by four kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year, which is a, a doubling of the ambient conditions. And that four kilograms of N per hectare per year is somewhat concerning because if you recall from the critical load slide, uh, four kilograms of N per hectare per year was about the critical load exceedance for acidification of alpine watersheds, which is what these montane eve systems directly leach nitrogen into. So maybe a cause for concern in the future. Um, tying this all back now into just defining a critical load of where the deposition rate, uh, you know, attains some detrimental impact, going to increase deposition between 3 to 10 kilograms of N per hectare per year. Um, we are unable to determine critical loads for the total soil end pool or the plant end uptake. Um, that may be due to the fact that these, these pools are so large that the small amount of nitrogen I applied didn't really have a large impact in such a short study. But if you do a, a long-term chronic study, you might start to see some impacts in these pools. However, however, as before, the nitrogen emissions were much more sensitive to deposition with uh, critical load being defined for nitrous oxide emissions between 3 to 13 kilograms of N per hectare per year. And a critical load for leaching in both winter and summer as between 3 to 6 kilograms of N per hectare per year. So these losses, you know, are, you, you start to see detrimental in impacts at rates slightly above what we're already receiving in the Cascades and other parts of the Northwest. Finally, I want to investigate how climate change might affect these critical loads by impacting the nitrogen cycling uh, of these ecosystems. And to do this, I use my field measurements to parameterize the regional, regional hydroecologic simulation system model that we use in Bioworth. And then I looked at, looked at different climate change impacts um, with different climate change and nitrogen deposition scenarios. Something that's important to consider when considering these impacts is how important snowpack is for these systems. As I mentioned, uh, under current conditions, like you can see for 2016, their growing season is only about you know two to four months out of the year. Most of the year, these things are effectively in winter where they're covered by snowpack. That really changes when you increase our ambient air temperatures. You lose up to 80% of our snowpack. And so in the year 2050, as opposed to having you know two to four months of summer, instead you might see six months of summer where half the year is a growing season and half the year is under snowpack. And that really de determines and changes a lot of the uh, biogeochemistry happening in these systems. Something to keep in mind um, as you see the next results. So again, I, in these scenarios, I increase temperature by about 2 degrees Celsius, and I increase deposition rate by uh, 5 kilograms of N per hectare per year above ambient rates. And we saw that the vegetation really, really responded to these, these conditions. Um, with the snowpack, snowpack melting earlier, we saw the growing season double in length, allowing the vegetation to, up, to increase their nitrogen uptake by 300%. So a real large response. Um, didn't really see any impact in the amount of nitrogen the soil uh, pool was able to retain, however. Um, the losses also responded quite a bit as well, but the responses of the losses depended on the season. So during the, I'll call it the snow covered season, um, we saw that the snow melted out earlier and this drove higher nitrogen losses. Um, again, with the same conditions of increased temperature and, uh, and deposition, we saw that nitrous oxide emissions during the snow cover period increased by 200% because you had a lot, lot more soil moisture that could drive the nitrification that drives um, N emissions. Um, because of the increased soil moisture from, from earlier snow melt, we also saw that nitrogen leaching increased by about 100% um, during the snow covered season. However, the, re the reverse was true during the growing season. Once that snow melted, these systems really dried up, and without any soil moisture to dry the nitrogen cycling, um, you didn't. You actually saw a decrease in nitrous oxide emissions from our ambient conditions by about 50%, and a decrease in nitrogen leaching by about 80%. So in short, you'd see a lot more loss of nitrogen um, in the winter with increased increased soil moisture from earlier snow snow melt, but in summer that system dries up. It really limits how much nitrogen loss can occur. So summarize these findings.
we found that high elevation nitrogen deposition was higher than we previously projected based on these low elevation deposition uh, network measurements. And we need further research to determine some of these regional sources of ammonium and what ammonium might be affecting these kind of remote uh, montane systems. Um, we determined that critical loads for each system and loss were between three to six kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year, and that these rates could cause increased greenhouse gas production from nitrous oxide and increased nitrogen leaching at these near ambient rates, if, if ambient rates between three to four were already close to those, those that critical load exceedance. Uh, we were unable to determine the critical loads for vegetation and soil nitrogen storage. Uh, that might be due to the short-term nature of the study, and those might be, we might be able to find a critical load if we carry the study out for a longer time period. And finally, we found that uh, climate change impacts on critical loads depend on the season, with earlier snow melt um, really enhancing nitrogen loss uh, in winter, but uh, nitrogen retention was enhanced in summer as the earlier snow melt led to uh, decreased soil moisture and really dried up that that water cycle and that end cycle. And so kind of something to think about for management, kind of trying to summarize the, the whole webinar today. Um, as Sarah discussed, we found that nitrogen deposition has increased with the intensification of agriculture and urbanization in the, in the Northwest. Um, the forms of deposition vary by emission source um, with agricultural emissions contributing to ammonium and combustion contributing to nit uh, nitrate deposition and that these deposition rates may exceed critical, critical loads in some sense of ecosystems within the Northwest. Um, we've discussed how elevated rates can have detrimental impacts on sense of ecosystems ranging from decreased biodiversity to increased fire risk and then acidification, nutrification of watersheds. And something to consider for uh, management, some strategies we might think about is the reduction and mitigation uh, nitrogen deposition might be necessary to avoid critical low exceedance, uh, particularly in class one areas. So either reducing nitrogen emissions, those that affect class one areas, or using management techniques that might mitigate some of these uh, negative impacts. And I can discuss those more in the questions, if there are any questions about that. And I think that'll about wrap it up. All right, thank you, Justin. Um, so it looks like I see uh, several great questions coming in. And we have plenty of time to take several questions, I think. So go ahead and continue to ask those in the questions pod. Um, so I'll begin with a question for Sarah. And um, were most of your lichen samples from forested habitats rather than subalpine or alpine lichens? And if so, would you expect to see different patterns or trends in nitrogen deposition in different environments? And do you think that sampling in high elevation would be a nice step for future research? So I know that's several parts. I can always <laughs> repeat, repeat some of that. I guess sort of to begin with, um, maybe you could describe whether most of your lichen samples were from forested habitats rather than being subalpine or alpine. Like yeah, I yeah. Discussed. I think I, I think I have all the parts to that question. Um, and yes, most of the lichens that I sampled were in forested habitats throughout the western U.S. And um, I I do think if um, to 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 bridge into a lot of those different ecosystems that do exist throughout the West, though, um, I think we would have to look at different lichen species. And I know when I was first starting out, I really wanted to stick to just very well vetted species since we were dealing with issues of um, you know. How, how the lichens were collected by literally hundreds of different individuals that contributed to the herbaria. And, um, and, and so really wanted to stick to species that had been, like Lotharia vulpina, that has, that has been used extensively by, by groups like the Forest Service and, the, and, and, and other individuals. And so, um, and so if, if we were to move into these different habitats with this type of analysis, it would be crucial to use different species to really capture um, you know species that went that that is their you know that is their habitat that is their niche and I think if we moved into these different um, ecosystems I do think we would find slightly different trends especially in the stable isotope values about which sources are contributing and and how much those different types of sources are contributing I know um, even just within the the four species that I looked at I didn't really get a chance to talk about this today just because there's only so much you can fit into to one webinar. Um, but that 
uh, even among the four species that I looked at, Lothario vulpina and three others, there were differences within each region. And the most logical difference to, to, to explain the differences between species is really their location on that landscape. Even though they're within the same geographic region, there's just there, I, there is so much variability in deposition, and, and Justin's work also points this out, how the differences that he observed between the NADP site at low elevation and the measurements he was making in subalpine ecosystems that, um, I mean, I think fine, understanding those, those finer spatial scale variations in deposition, I think is going to be crucial to really understanding which e ecosystems are impacted and to what degree. Great, thank you. And Kind of a follow-up question to that, do you find that lichens become more scarce in high deposition levels? Um. Um, so <laughs> um, I, since I wasn't in the field actually sampling these lichens, um, I, I, I can't really answer that question, but what I can say about it is that um, I noticed that through the herbaria record that throughout time, oftentimes, especially in areas that are um, very, very highly frequented, like national parks, um, areas near national parks, um, I would notice that over time, it, when you, the, a lot of the samples would be in very um, easily accessible locations in the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, but as you start getting to the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, the the sampling of the lichens was often in more remote locations, and they were harder to find on you know harder to find on maps and really understand where they were coming from. Um, so. I, I, I can speak to it on that level. Um, since I w wasn't in the field sampling these lichens from, you know, 1930 and before, um, I, I, I can't speak to it firsthand, but I can speak to what I've noticed in looking at their barrier records and the, the, the metadata that accompanied each of the samples. Great. Interesting. Um, so I have a question here for Justin. What effects do you expect to see from the pulse of nitrogen during snow melt, and does that heighten or lessen the overall ecological impact of nitrogen deposition in these high alpine environments? Yeah, that depends on what impact you're looking for. So in my work, looking at nitrogen losses like nitrous oxide emissions and leaching, um, that pulse as the snow melts really does heavily impact um, those losses because you have at the same time as nitrogen is leaving the snowpack you have all that water that's being stored in snow flooding into the soil as well and the kind of key ingredients for nitrogen loss in these systems and in many systems is water and inorganic nitrogen it's all you really need to drive a lot of these emissions and leaching um, however for other impacts and different and different systems um, it kind of depends a bit more but at least for sub subalpine and alpine systems for nitrogen loss that pulse really does drive a lot of that. And that's kind of why we see um, higher rates of nitrogen loss under climate change. Because our current situation is that we have, you know, snow builds up uh, all winter long and then kind of melts roughly at one time, and just one continuous melt. Um, what we found in our climate change simulations was instead of having one consistent snow cover all winter long, we went from a snow dominated system to a rain dominated system. And so you'd have intermittent snow cover that would build up and then melt, and that melt would flood the system again temporarily with nitrogen and water, enhancing that nitrogen loss, as opposed to having that kind of storage all winter long in one large pulse. And because we had that kind of intermittent, intermittent flooding and of nitrogen and water, that really enhanced a lot of the nitrogen loss as well. So I hope that answers the – well, I know at least that's what, that's what I can tell about the, uh, the effects and – my system. Good, good, thank you. And another um, attendee has asked, um, there's a coal-fired power plant in Bucota, Washington that's been identified as a pollutant source to Mount Rainier, and from your research, do you believe that that could be um, a dominant source of nitrogen deposition? I mean, it's tough to say specifically. Um, that's something that you could try to look at potentially using some of the stabilized type techniques that Sarah mentioned and try to trace back a specific source. But one of the problems with looking at deposition in one location is that, you know, uh, as the winds kind of blow around, you're getting, you're getting sources from all over specific regions, so different distances away. And actually Sarah can probably speak, speak more about this with her, some of her modeling work. 
but she has used uh, batch trajectory modeling to look at different emission sources and how far they've traveled um, to try to pinpoint what certain regions might be affecting certain areas. Um, so it's tough to say, it's tough to pinpoint down like this is a specific polluter necessarily. We can kind of look at larger picture trends like, oh, well, we see more combustion sources impacting deficit in this area or more, you know, fertilization sources impacting this area. But it's tough to really nail down, like, it's definitely from this one location without having some kind of, you know, ecological forensic evidence to do so. So I'm not yeah. sure if you, if you want to contribute a bit more on that or not. Yeah, and I mean, that would be a very feasible thing to do, but um, the just the, the approach that Justin took really, really doesn't allow you to target a specific source like that. Um, part of, another part of my dissertation involved looking at the National Atmospheric Deposition Program weekly precipitation samples, and in some instances we could we could do that for a single week where it was you know a single event, a precipitation event during that week. But to really do that kind of targeted work to identify if it's you know a, a specific coal plant really requires event-based sampling, and, and then some of the same same techniques, but but just a different sampling approach along with some of the back trajectory modeling that I was able to do where you can trace where, where the precipitation and where the deposition came from for that specific event. And, um, and that would be a great project. Um, <laughs> um, but that's, unfortunately, we, we were, that wasn't, that wasn't exactly what we did, so. Good. And another question for you, Sarah. Um, there's there's a question here about whether there are sort of parallels to your research in other regions, other parts of the U.S. or world, where lichens are being used to um, gain a picture of some of the sources of of nitrogen. Yeah, there um, there has been a, a couple um, really well done studies. Um, one has been done in Germany um, using different species than I use that are a little bit more tolerant to the higher nitrogen deposition levels that they have in Germany and showed really well the um, the effects of urban versus agriculture and different, different as those sources changed across the landscape within a, within a region of Germany. My German geography is really poor so I don't remember exactly the exact region. Um, and then there's also been a few isolated studies here and there looking at a, a much more small scale. Um, one compared ro lichens near roadways with different levels of traffic and um, and and really those help help build um, and help supported the the leap that I then took to look at it at a, a broad regional scale and so um, there there are uh, pockets of really uh, that have used stable isotope analysis in conjunction with looking at the amount of nitrogen in lichens and um, to better under, understand the nitrogen source, the local nitrogen sources, and, and having that local background lets me um, take it take it to the next, you know, larger spatial scale at the regional level. Good, interesting. And um, here's a question for Justin. Although again, you guys may both have comments on this. Are there ecosystem management strategies that can mitigate or compensate for some of the negative impacts? of increasing nitrogen deposition um, that we see in high alpine ecosystems? Yeah, I mean, mitigation is somewhat difficult for these regions because they are so remote. I mean, the region, the area I worked at, Mount Rainier, was, it was nice for me. I could just, you know, drive up to uh, 5,000 feet of paradise and hike the rest of the way. But a lot of these high elevation ecosystems require either, you know, a lot of backcountry hiking um, or helicopters to really, to really get to. And so management in these regions is going to be especially difficult without, you know, a huge increase in, in resources. So I think mitigation in these areas is going to be more challenging than it might be in some more accessible areas. So I think a better strategy, uh, if you want to look at minimizing the impacts of deposition as opposed to mitigation might just be looking at reduction of emissions if possible. We, we, as Sarah mentioned, we've seen that since the uh, passage of the Clean Air Act and reduction of NOx emissions. But what we found, and others have found, is that um, ammonium emission, ammonia, ammonia emissions and ammonium deposition has increased um, with uh, agricultural intensification. And so looking more at reduction of emissions from different sectors um, might be a more feasible strategy to try to, man to try to minimize these detrimental impacts 
than trying to manage for these really remote and hard to access regions, unfortunately. Yeah, and just to take on to that, that I mean, that was really part of having those really complicated stabilized so patterns with the lichens is really just pointing to that it is all these different sectors that emit, emit nitrogen contributing to the problem. And so, so mitigating is, I think, going to be a very daunting type of step, but, but necessary to, um, if, if we want to, you know, minimize the, crit the critical load exceedances in the sensitive ecosystems like the subalpine um, uh, ecosystems that Justin worked in. Good. Um, thank you both. And I let me look here. I think there was just one question that I, I may have skipped over accidentally. Um, yeah, could you expand on what were the limitations in determining a critical load and what information do you think would be needed in addition to establish critical loads for some specific ecosystems? And I think that was a question directed at Justin, although again, I think Sarah or Justin may, may be able to speak a little bit to yeah, I can talk how about critical it. loads are determined. Mm -hmm. So my study, the approach I used was looking at a critical load as here's what the ambient condition I'm interested in is. So for example, nitrogen leaching, we, we went and determined the baseline leaching rates. And then we then we use this additional estrogen to find where that rate might significantly increase with increased deposition and use that to define a critical load. Um, one of the challenges of using that kind of approach is that there's been, at least in the Cascade Range, this is not true for all the Northwest, but at least in the Cascade Range with these high elevation systems, there have been very, there haven't been that, as many studies kind of characterizing the biogeochemistry of these systems. So it's hard to say whether our ambient conditions are have always been that way, like you know, were they that way um, pre pre settlement, or were they uh, have they are they increased? And I'm just now I'm using ambient as like the already increased levels and determining critical load from what's already kind of excessive. Um, so that's definitely one of the limitations that I'm using I, in, in, in my approach. I'm, I'm trying to you know uh, mitigate somewhat. Another uh, limitation is it's defining a critical load really depends on what um, management, resource managers are interested in because you can look at critical loads, you know, detrimental impacts, it kind of depends on how you want to define a detrimental impact and different, uh, from my experience, different people define it in different ways. And so trying to find where that detrimental level is um, can vary when you're talking to different groups. Um, so trying to, you know, when you were talking to somebody, trying to establish what they consider detrimental impact to be that is, yeah, that, I think that's essential for establishing what, therefore, a critical load um, is as well. And Sarah, I'm not sure if you wanted to, if you had more to add to that, or if you're. Uh... Yeah, I mean, um, as I define critical loads, and especially in this in this talk, is I I really built off the research of of other people and, and um, a lot of work done by the U.S. Forest Service in. in you know, defining that specific critical load in different ways, and and you you could define it differently, um, you know, depending upon the you know the management concerns, the you know what portions of the ecosystem you really are striving to protect, and which ones you're you know are, are deemed okay to suffer a bit of damage, and 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 so I I mean I just adopted it for this talk, and and just another thing on the critical loads is that you know that like a nitrogen content value that I use. Um, can vary across the landscape and between different areas dependent on, you know, local factors like, like precipitation regimes and things like that. And so um, they don't, they aren't necessarily static and, and you know, um, and just one blanket value for like the entire western U.S. They're, they're, they're much more flexible and, and designed to kind of serve the needs of management. Great. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Justin. Um, and so with that, I think that we're going to end our question period for today. I want to be sure that I have time to wrap up and finish before our 11 o'clock end time. Um, so thank you all for participating in this webinar today. And as you sign off, please do take a minute to fill out our evaluation survey that will help us
develop um, meaningful, useful uh, webinar content in the future and um, kind of target your information needs. And while you do that, I'd like to um, just again thank you and say based on the number of participants and the wide range of questions that we had asked today, I think there's a real clear interest in these topics and we're working hard to ensure that the results of this research and modeling effort are relevant and accessible to diverse natural resource decision makers and other researchers in our Northwest U.S. region. So um, please do check out the CSANR blog and our partner news and information website, www.agclimate.net. These are two avenues through which we share the results um, of current natural resources and climate research in the Northwest. Um, so thanks again for joining us. We do hope that you'll register for upcoming webinars in this series, the next of which is going to be held on January 10th, which is also a Tuesday at 10 a.m., and we'll focus on climate change impacts in the Columbia River Basin rangelands and cropland systems. Um, you can see the full lineup for this webinar series and descriptions of what's to come on our CSANR webinar website. So thank you all and have a great day.